Now we're turning to the prophecy of Zechariah this morning. And the easier found turning in from the Old Testament, back from Matthew, you have just Malachi, and then you have Zechariah. The penultimate book of the Old Testament, the one before the last. And we're at Zechariah, and we're at the chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3, uh, very amazing scriptures the Lord has led us to this morning. And I want to take your time, take, take, I want you to take your time and read with us as we read through these verses and keep your Bible open then afterwards. And uh, chapter 3 of Zechariah and verse 1. And, uh, and he showed me. The, this here is, is the third of eight visions uh, that God gave to the prophet Zechariah after re the return of the uh, Jewish people from the Babylonish captivity. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. Now, where you get that phrase most times in the Old Testament, it's what we call a theophany. It's the pre-incarnate Son of God. It is the Lord Jesus Christ appearing before he appeared at Bethlehem's manger. Remember, he said to the Pharisees one day before Abram was, I am. He's the eternal Son of God. And we did a study some years ago, off and on, on the theophanies, on the appearance of our Lord Jesus into situations in the Old Testament. And it's an amazing study. It's an amazing study. And here is another one of them here. The angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Now, I want you to look at that, and I want you to get this into your mind this morning, that Satan is real. You see, it says that Satan is standing. That's his posture here. You see the place here. He's in where the high priest or the chief priest only is allowed to go. He's a cheeky boy. You see the place. You see the purpose. His purpose is to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Do you think the Lord's talking to himself? No, he's not. So we'll see that in a minute. The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. That's the angels that stood before him. Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with the change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed them with garments, and the angel of the Lord stood by. The angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among those that stand by. Hear now, O Joshua, 
the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for there men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant. That's the Lord Jesus again, the branch, that's him again, capital letters. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, even upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall ye call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. And we know that God will bless to us the reading of his own precious and eternal word. Haggai and Zechariah were contemporary prophets. That is, they prophesied around the same time to the nation of Israel. And that time was, as you know, those of you who listened to the four messages on Haggai, was at the return of the 70 years of Babylonish captivity. And a lot of their messages had to do with the reconstructing, the restoring, and the reestablishing of Solomon's great temple. It had been cast down. It had been burnt. It had been ruined on their prior being taken into to captivity. Now, the main purpose for this house of God and for every house of God is to worship the Lord. And it's to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness and in glory and in praise and in prayer. The law of Moses in Exodus and Leviticus laid down the pattern how those services would be conducted in the house of God. Sacrifices and offerings and ceremonies were a daily event. Those of you who study and read through Exodus and Leviticus will be enthralled by the detail of the tabra of the temple and the worship there. Now, none of that worship could have been done at all without the priests. In fact, in the book of Ezra, we are told that 4,289 priests came back from Babylon. Now, the high priest was the main man. He was the only one who could supplicate, mediate, officiate between God and the people. And he entered into the holiest of all in the temple once a year. He entered in with his royal blue robes, his fine white linen, his ephod, his girdle, his mitre and breastplate, and he offered a sacrifice for his own sins first and then for the sins of the people. Now, when we come to Zechariah chapter 3, they're back after 70 years. They have reestablished and refurbished and are repracticing now once more the office of the high priest and the law that went with it in the old economy. And I want you to look at verse 1 because this is an awesome verse of Scripture. And, Je and Zechariah, in this third of his eight visions, was shown by the Holy Spirit Joshua. He saw Joshua. God gave him a vision of Joshua. He literally saw him. Joshua, and I don't get the Joshua's mixed up. It's nothing to do with the other Joshua that led the people over the Jordan. There are many Joshua's in the Bible. This was Joshua, the high priest, and he's standing before the angel of the Lord. Just forget the garments now that he is on him for a moment. But can't you see in that verse that Satan, our adversary, the devil, is standing at his right hand? 
That was where the accuser always stood and always does and still to this day stands in a court of law. We have Satan and he has entered into the holy place and he's standing at the high priest's right hand before the Lord. And he's there to resist him. Now, I'll be saying more about that in a moment, but let me say this. I have written over this statement of Satan standing at his right hand, the fearfulness of Satan. The fearfulness of Satan. Now, how do we make that out? I mean, I'm saying he was fearful. How do we make that out? when we see the blatant foe where he is ruthlessly standing, how would he have the nerve to go in to this place at all? Well, my friend, he has and had. You see, in the book of Job, when God met with the angels, Satan also came among them. Now, we want you to get into your mind something of the power that we are dealing with in our lives and in these last days. And we're going to expose the work of Satan this morning. In the Gospels, he alone faced the Lord Jesus Christ for 40 days and 40 nights. And where there's an opportunity... He'll disrupt, he'll destroy, and he'll accuse, and he'll slander, and he'll do it blatantly. He's not afraid in that sense. But what he is afraid of is this. Why did he not send some of his demons here? Because I want to emphasize again, he's afraid. What is he afraid of? He knows the danger of a holy man of God shut in with his God, close to the Lord, interceding at the throne of glory on the behalf of himself and on the behalf of others. He'll resist that. When we come on behalf of the church, when we come on behalf of the nation, when we come on behalf of our families, he knows that. He knows that it's in there where holy men and women of God, he knows that it's in there that the strongholds can be dismantled. He knows that it's in there, those holy men of God interceding before God with clean hands and a pure heart. He knows, he knows that the strongholds, his strongholds can be pulled down that way. And he's afraid of that. He knows that. When we go into the sacred place, And let me say this morning, every one of us are priests. The New Testament teaches us of the priesthood of every believer. And you're a priest this morning, and I am a priest this morning, and we have the right to come into the sacred place, and we have the right to come close to the Lord. And we have a right to command blessing. And we have the right to command souls. The devil, afraid of of, 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 of souls being released from his darkness, from his grip, his number one task is to damn souls. And my friend, where souls are released is in the in the holy place. Where souls are released is where holy men and women are battling at the kingdom of hell. And he's afraid of that. And we'll be saying more about this as we close, but stamped across the head of the high priest was the mitre, the white mitre, and across it was written, holiness. You see, the place that he stood was a holy place. He's behind the high priest who's a holy, supposed to be a holy high priest. He's standing before the Holy Son of God. 
You know, during the building of the temple, any, any confusion appeared didn't seem to come just from Satan, come from some of his emissaries, I believe, he, because he's not afraid of buildings. It's not the building that he's opposing. Could I get that over this morning? I wish to God we could get it into the heads and hearts of people. It's not the building that he's opposing. He's not afraid of the spires and the stained glass windows. He's not afraid of our three million pound state-of-the-art buildings. They're not a threat to him. When the disciples sat on the Mount of Olives in Matthew 24, they looked over at the this same temple, only refurbished and millions of pounds put into it by Herod. They looked over it and they said, see the temple, Lord, see the temple, as the sun was setting on it with all its glory and all its beauty. And the Lord says, there's coming a day when there'll not be one stone left upon another. The Lord wasn't taken up with buildings. In fact, the devil encouraged buildings and he encouraged crowds. Do you know the only other place that we read of the devil standing was before David when he provoked, when he was provoked by the devil to number the people? God said to him, don't number the people. He's at the end of his journey, and God has mightily blessed David. And this was his last folly. God said to him, don't number the people. And Job, his ungodly commander-in-chief of his armed forces, told him, listen, David, don't number the people. Sometimes the ungodly have more sense than the godly. Sometimes an unsaved man can give you better advice than a carnal Christian. And God says, don't be numbering the people. And Job, the ungodly man, says, don't be numbering the people. But David says, I'm going to number the people. And it took him 10 months to number them. You know the story. 10 months to number them. From Dan to Beersheba. He went through them and, and he counted up on 500,000 fighting men. And he was glorying in the men. And he was glorying in the army. And he was glorying in, And God was angry. And do you know what God did? He slew 70,000 of them. 70,000 he slew just in the crack. Because he numbered the people. And why was that? Because the glory was being taken from God. The glory was being taken away from God. In the next chapter in Zechariah, we read, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. It's not the might of men. It's not big buildings and it's not big numbers. It's the power of God. And that's what Satan's afraid of. And I say this very reverently speaking, he's not afraid of most of our midweek prayer meetings. He's not a bit afraid. And he's not a bit afraid of some of our wee chants in the morning with the daily reading. Not a bit of them. He's afraid of holy men and women of God taking on the powers of hell with clean hands and a pure heart and open to God and nothing between them and God. And then he's afraid. He's afraid. Praying in the Holy Ghost. He's afraid because that sort of closeness to the Lord and that sort of intercession, I tell you, my friend, releases souls and it restores backsliders and he doesn't want backsliders restored. And God, God knows Northern Ireland has plenty of them, thousands of them. Tyrone has thousands of them. And when you go into the holy place and you go in and you begin to intercede for the release of sinners and for the restoring of backsliders and for the revival of the Holy Ghost, I tell you this, you'll have Satan at your right hand. And he'll be there. So you see the fearfulness of Satan and then we see the scornfulness of Satan because he's at his right hand to resist him. He's not there to say amen to his prayers. He's not there to encourage him. He's there to resist him. And that word is to slander him, to accuse him, to vilify him, to attack him. 
So when you get into prayer and intercession and you're going a couple of minutes and you're doing well and your mind starts to wander everywhere and everything else starts to come in and you have to pack it up, that's the devil near you. What does Revelation say? He's the accuser of the brethren and he accuses us before our God night and day. He's an accuser. Night and day. He never gives in. Whenever you move to do anything for God or go anywhere for God or get a bit spiritual for God and switch off the old box and set things apart and say, God, I want to be clean. I want to be holy. I want to be filled. I want to be used. I want to give my life for fresh to thee. I tell you, when you start to do that, you know there's a devil. He's the accuser. You might have even heard him this morning when you were walking across the car park. Look at him. Look at her. You just see, Lord, if you just seen what they were at during the week, well, the Lord knows rightly what you were at during the week. Look at him. Look at her. Oh, oh look. And, and they're going to stay for the table too. <laughs> look at what they were doing on Monday. And look at what they were doing on Tuesday. Look at what they were looking at last night. That's his trade. That's his trade. But my friend, the thing about it is this. The devil tells the truth when it suits him. And he's telling the truth here, as you'll see in a minute, about Joshua and his garments. Oh, he can tell the truth when it suits him. And he can tell the truth about us, you know. He can tell the truth about me. And about you. What is the truth this morning? What is the devil? What is the devil slandering to the Savior about us this morning? What is he accusing us of? Hmm? What is he mocking us about? What is he saying that we have done which was unclean and unholy and not right? What is he saying? Is he saying, there's a man away into church there this morning that never spent five minutes with me during the week? Is that what he's saying? There's people who go into church this morning that have no family altar in the house and they never gathered their children around and they're away into church this morning. Is that what he's saying? Hmm? What is he saying? That's truth. There's a man who went to church this morning and he's as dark and he's as doomed and he's as damned as the man in the pub in Dungan. You were away drinking in some old pub last night. But he said, that's truth. Maybe. The devil tells the truth. He's a slander. Slander. He's telling the truth about Joshua here, the holy high priest. And I want you to look at that now in verse 2. And, uh, and verse two. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that has chosen thee. Verse 3. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. Did you notice there that Joshua never opened his mouth? As soon as the enemy began to accuse him, the Lord stepped in. And thank God for that this morning. I tell you this morning, while there's one interceding at the right hand of the Savior, there's one interceding on earth, and it's the devil. He ever liveth to make intercession for us. And I thank God this morning that he's interceding for me and you all week. He's before the Father for us. The devil may be before him for us, slandering us, accusing us. But all the Lord wants to do is bless us this morning. Forgive us. 
Look what's he, look, look, Lord, look what he is on him. Look, look at what he's come in here with. Filthy garments. Now, the word filthy here is a very strong word. It's human excrement and vomit. Now, what is he saying? We know well what he's saying. Or how can a holy God look on that? So that's the stench before your very nostril. Does this boy not know what the law of Exodus and Leviticus says about the garments of the high priest, that he's supposed to be white linen and clean? And he has them, you know. Man, he has them. I wonder, has he us this morning? Lord, what does this look? He's saying, do, do you not, do you not, do you not, do you not see him? So this could not be, this should not be. This is completely and entirely against everything the Word of God teaches at your house and your temple and the, the high priest and his dress and his performance. How could you hear him? How could you answer him? Sure, it's shameful. And I tell you, we turn from the fearfulness of Satan and the scornfulness of Satan to the cheerfulness of Satan. I think that Satan was in his element here. Now, whether they didn't have the garments or whether they were soiled and all that when they were down in Babylon, I don't know the answer to that at all. But that's not the point of the message. The point of the message is this that he was supposed to be a holy man of God. But he was unclean in the sight of God. And I believe that the, that, that, that the, the, the devil was so sure that he was going to see uh, Joshua wiped out and the nation sent back into Babylonish captivity. But Joshua never opened his mouth in his defense, and the devil never spoke either that we read of. And I tell you, he's more dangerous when he's silent. He's more dangerous when he's silent. Do we realize this morning that we have a, a real, literal devil? and myriads of demons. Do you realize this morning that in these last days that they are, they are out and out? When our Lord Jesus Christ came the first time in the flesh as a babe to the manger and as 33 and a half years on this earth, every demon out of hell came out of hell to attack him. He was casting them out daily. It's the very same with the second coming. The nearer we get to the Lord's return again, coming again, the Bible tells us that all hell is going to be let loose and is being let loose on the mind, as you'll see in a minute, which should be a holy mind. Every dirty thing that he can muster. And I tell you, my friends, and I say this this morning, if you're not alone in the presence of God, in confession daily, he'll make mincemeat of you and your family and the churches, and he's doing well with the churches. We must all hang our head in shame here, for Joshua had nothing to say. What have you to say this morning? What have I to say this morning? 
Now, the question that I hear asked in prayer meetings and more and more, and I'm glad to hear it more and more coming from those that are praying, is this, Lord, why is revival tarrying in our land? Why is the church an intensive care unit? Why have we to put money under the seats that I'm hearing about a big church, put money under the seats that to get the people in, holiday brochures or holiday vouchers or whatever, to get the people in. Why have we to do that? Why have we to get Ferguson's and Nuffields and Massey tractors to get the people in? Why do we have to give out bars of chocolate and bottles of water into the shops in Dungannon to try to get people in? Why is that? Why is there churches talking, evangelical churches, talking about Christmas raffles? And I heard of one who had uh, uh, stopped their meetings for a smoke break. Why is this? Do you know what all that is? As a substitute for the Holy Ghost. That's what it is. And there's no substitute for the Holy Ghost. You can't get better than the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is not drawn. He is not working. He is not moving. Would it be because of unclean garments? And I have asked myself, and I ask it again this morning, Lord, is it me? Is it me? Ah, but praise God this morning. This sweet portion of Scripture doesn't end there. And I'm not going to end there either. For we're not ending in defeat this morning. I'll tell you, if he stands at the right hand of Joshua, I have won again, I say, who stands at the right hand of the Father for me. Let every one of us this morning take courage in verse 2. And the Lord said unto Satan, I tell you, he didn't give Joshua a chance to open his mouth. Man, he came, I love my Lord this morning. Many's a day he has stepped in just like that for me. Now, the devil would have wiped me out. He would have destroyed me, even in my unsaved days. Ah, look at the verse. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuked thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Israel. I tell you, you know what you have there? You have the Lord speaking to the Lord. You have God the Son speaking to God the Father. The Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus, who we are in no doubt that this was, did not rebuke him himself. He cried unto the Father to rebuke him. The Lord rebuked thee. So you have the Father there, you have the Son there, you have the Holy Spirit there. You see, this is big business. It's big business. This message is big business this morning, let me tell you. The Lord rebuke you. And twice in that verse, he has the word rebuke. The Lord, there's a double rebuke. And here's what he said. The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that has chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? I tell you what, what he's saying is this. He's, that word plucked is snatched. I have snatched this man from the fire. I have snatched Israel from the fire. I have snatched the children of God from the fire. Hallelujah. See, this is not a brand. A brand was only an old bit of a stick, you know. 
But you know, I don't know if you've done it, but I have done it. I've done it on more than one occasion. I've thrown a bundle of stuff into the fire and I've been watching it burn and I've seen something that I shouldn't went in at all. And I've got my heart burned taking it out and plucking it out. He says, is this not a brand snatched and plucked and pulled from the fire? I didn't bring Israel after 420 years out of Egypt. I didn't pluck them out of the hands of Pharaoh. Nor did I, to redeem them, nor did I bring them out of Babylon to restore them. For you to slander them and to destroy them. This is a brand plucked from the very fires. And Israel is a brand, a brand, a brand that we dare not go down that road this morning, plucked from the fires. And my friend, the day and hour that he saved you, wherever it was and whenever it was, you were a brand plucked out of the fire. And the day that he restored you, son, was the day that he plucked you back out of the fire. And I thank God he's plucking us out of the fire every day. It's a continual pluck and snatching as far as I'm concerned. For there's the accuser. I hear the accuser roar of things that I have done. I know them all and thousands more. But Jehovah findeth none. Let him slander all he likes. Let him hit the mind all he likes. But let me tell you, the only thing that concerns me is as far as I know, there's nothing betwixt me and my God. Oh, he says, I didn't take them out of Egypt to let you destroy them. I pulled them out of the fire and I pulled them out of Babylon and they're not going back into it either. Thank God I'm not going back to the old world and the old ways and I'm certainly not going to hell. Maybe you are this morning. Maybe you're not plucked out of the burning yet for you want to stay in the fire. Well, stay in it. He says, I plucked them, I grabbed them, I snatched them out of the fire. See the rebuking? You see the plucking? You see the choosing? He says, I have chosen, I have chosen, chosen Jerusalem. Now here as we come to a close, you see the stripping. Verse 4, And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, that was the angels, saying, Take away the filthy garments, take the filthy garments of Joshua, take them off him. And I can tell you that means every last one of them. And I can tell you that he was stripped naked. Because the high priest, before he went into the holiest of all, had to bathe himself in clean water. There has to be a stripping. God's not in the business of covering over dirt. He's not in the business of patching things up. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth them and forsaketh them will find mercy. Before the new garments went on him, the old ones had to come off. <laughs> and that takes me to the lovely story in Luke 15 of the prodigal son. <laughs> oh, there's so much here this morning. I tell you, they were filthy. There was a stink of the pigs of them down at the swine truck. And when he came back to the father's house, the father says, bring forth the best robe. Take the old garments off and put on the best robe. I tell you, when we came to Christ with all our filth and sin and darkness and evil, my dear friend, he clothed us in his righteousness. Washed in the blood of the Lamb. 
All our sins and iniquities on him were laid. We'll see that now as we close. There was a, there had to be a stripping. I say to you this morning, stop trying to cover up. And I know that I'm not preaching to this congregation this morning, and how I know is because a man from Scotland rang me the other day to say that 500 messages from this pulpit has gone out over England, Wales, and Ireland, and America, and I got an email this morning from a man in, Ameri in, in Australia. And I thank God for these people at the back. And I thank God that people are listening to preaching and truth. There has to be a stripping. There has to be a, 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 a doing away with the old sin and the old habits and the old things, my friend. Get rid of the old tobacco and get rid of the old things that hinder you in your walk for God. And let your garments smell clean. And above all, be clean and holy when you come into the presence of the Lord and around his table. There has to be a stripping. And then there had to be a washing. As I said, for the high priest had to wash himself. And Paul says, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh, perfecting holiness in the sight of God. There has to be a plucking. There was a, there was a plucking, there was a rebuking, there was a, a stripping, there was a washing, there was a changing. He changes the garments. And there was a dressing. Look at verse 4. Again, take away the filthy garments from him on him. Behold, I have caused thy iniquity, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. I tell you, he was attired in the garb that he should have been retired of. He was clothed in the righteousness of the high priest's linen girdle and a mitre placed upon his head. It was a turban. It was white. Speaking of purity, it had holiness stamped across it. And I tell you, my friends, if ever there was a day we needed clean minds just today, if ever we needed to watch our minds and the devil and his lies and his deceit, it is today. He clothed. Listen to what Count Zinderdorf said in one of the hymns. I was going to sing it this morning. I didn't think we'd be able for it. Jesus, thy blood and righteousness. My beauty is my glorious dress. Miss, miss, miss flaming worlds in this arrayed, with joy shall I lift up my head. And when the high priest lifted up his head, you could see stamped across it was holiness. Unto the Lord. <coughs> Quickly, he was plucked, he was stripped, he was washed, he was changed, he was, he was dressed. I want you to see verse 9 as we close and come round the table. For behold the stone that I have laid. Now I want to say in verse 8, you have the branch and you have the servant, both reflecting Christ. You have the stone reflects to Christ, but we're not interested in that this morning. I will engrave the graving host thereof, said the Lord of hosts. Now watch this. I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. Now you get as many commentaries, good commentaries as you like, and you know what you read. That was the day, the day of crucifixion. That was the day that my blessed Lord, who, who, who hung naked, who was stripped, he was stripped, he was stripped naked, not for his sins, but for our sins. He had no sin. He was wholly harmless 
and separate from sinners, and he hung stripped naked on that old cross of Calvary. And on that day, I tell you this, on that day, what does it say? On that day, I will remove the iniquity of the land. And when you and I came to Christ as sinners, my friend, that Calvary covers it all. For there he died, crowned with thorns, rose again and lives in the power of an endless life and ever lives to intercede for us. And when the devil opens his mouth, he can shut it. Oh, Calvary's here, all right. And I'll tell you there's more than that. In that day in verse 10, saith the Lord of hosts, shall ye call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. That speaks of peace and it speaks of rest and it speaks of shelter and it speaks of protection. Under the fig tree was a great place to go in the burning sun. I tell you we're under the fig tree this morning. I tell you we're protected this morning. I tell you we're forgiven this morning. We're cleansed this morning. Don't let the devil, and listen, if he's telling the truth, go and do something about it. Turn it back on himself. God turned this back on Satan. He was in there for a slandering match, an accusing match. He was in here for destruction. He was in here to wipe this man Joshua out. He was in here to bring the people back into bondage. He was in here to accuse them and lie before, part of it lies, part of it not, before the living God. But the Lord was there, hallelujah, and he's here this morning. And he says to you this morning, listen. Cast off them old things this morning. Whatever they might be, you know I don't. And get down before the Lord. And if you want to leave leave and go around the side or come up to the front, we, we let the table go if men and women are desperately seeking God. But as we come round the table, remember this. That the devil will accuse us. And that's why some of you are going out in the mornings, he's accusing you. And he might be telling the truth, and he might not. Because he knows what suits every one of us. And there's no reason why men and women shouldn't be round and break this bread and drink this wine if they're redeemed of the Lord. Not a reason at all if everything's right with you and God. If there's nothing between you and God, I know people have to go and have children. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you before God and me before God. God forbid that we would taste of these things or touch these things or come into the presence of God around this holy table and this bread and wine, what it remembers. And the devil would slander us and what he would say would be the truth. God help us that that may not be the case. So let us flee this morning. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And before the devil opens his mouth, the Lord shall have him. He has him dealt with. He's defeated. And he knows it, and he's afraid. That's what he's afraid of. He'll be afraid of this prayer meeting on Saturday night. He's afraid of the Friday morning ones too, and probably the Thursday night too. He's afraid of praying men and women. But we're not going to back off when he's defeated. We're not going to back off now. We're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from the victory. And we're going in to see the strongholds of Satan pulled down and the power of the Holy Ghost wiping through our land.